mechanical engineering department this seminar, and it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Peng Cheng. Uh, so Dr. Cheng uh, is currently a tenure track assistant professor in the School of Computational Science and Engineering at Georgia Tech. Previously, he was a research scientist at the Olden Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, before joining UT Austin, he spent a year as a lecturer and postdoc at ETH Zurich uh, from 2014 to 2015. He obtained his PhD degree in computational mathematics from EPFL in 2014. His research is driven by challenging problems in science and engineering fields that involve data-driven modeling, learning, and optimization of complex systems under uncertainty, uh, and focuses on scientific machine learning, uncertainty quantification, Bayesian inference, experimental design, and stochastic optimization. So it is uh, uh, definitely my pleasure to, uh, uh, to introduce him, and please uh, join me to welcome Professor Chen for today's um, great presentation. Um, then the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Xuan, uh, for uh, your kind invitation and uh, the introduction. Uh, so uh, um, I'm very glad, it's my great pleasure to share with you some of our recent work on derivative informed uh, neural operators. So I started doing this work when I was in uh, UT Austin, working with uh, a few people here, uh, Omar Gattas, uh, Jin Cheng Luo, Thomas Olier Rosemary, uh, Umberto Villa. And, uh, uh, when I joined George Dack, uh, I started to work with the students, Jin Wu Go, um, part of the project. So uh, today I'm going to introduce, um, you know, this method for um, a few different applications. I will not go into depth, but rather uh, sort of like a brief introduction of different problems and uh, how this method is being uh, developed and applied to different uh, applications. So let's get started. Um, Maybe just click on the slide in case it's not focused. Yeah, so it looks like, a, okay. okay, all right. So uh, let me give you the first example. Maybe let me move this uh, zoom Maybe away. Click more on the right uh, more. Okay. And hide. Hide a uh, video panel? Hide a floating video panel? Yeah, 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 this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. So yeah, uh, the first example is about a, uh, Bayesian inference of Antarctica ice sheet flow. So from here, you can see a uh, sort of like a satellite data uh, of uh, essentially the velocity of uh, the ice flow um, the, for the attend uh, Antarctica. Uh, so essentially, um, you know, right now there is evidence of accelerated uh, ice sheet flow because of their um, possibly global warming. Uh, and uh, so if the whole, for instance, like uh, Antarctica ice get melted and then there will be a uh, a very significant rise of uh, the sea level. So I want to learn um, sort of like uh, this process, essentially a uh, prediction to the future. Uh, but however, given this data of the satellite data, um, how do we properly you know, model this system and also incorporate the data uh, to make the prediction, right? So here um, for the model itself, we have a nonlinear risk cost incompressible uh, fluid flow, essentially some nonlinear stocks equation. And then we have the uncertainty of the system, which is uh, essentially where you know, where the ice touch the ground. And uh, we don't really know their uh, boundary condition over there because it's a quite complex. And you see, for instance, in here is uh, the boundary condition. And uh, uh, so here we have the data of uh, the satellite observation of uh, the surface ice flow velocity. So the optimization problem is to, uh, um, you know, find this uncertain parameter, which is uh, the boundary condition. Either find it through, let's say, you want to find a maximum of a posterior point of the parameter, or you want to ca uh, characterize their, let's say, posterior distribution based on your prior uh, assumption of uh, uh, this parameter. And uh, so apparently there is a certain challenge, for instance, like the uncertainties on the whole boundary, it's uh, a field dependent variable, right? And uh, um, okay, so the second uh, example is uh, uh, quite related to what uh, she's working on, like there's an optimal experimental design or experimental design. For instance, here, the application is uh, how to best um, place their uh, tsunami uh Because once there is a tsunami, essentially uh, because of the earthquake uh, in the sea floor, sea, uh, sea floor and uh, uh, so you want to detect this signal, right? So the initial best, uh, 
you can detect some of the acoustic signal. So essentially this acoustic wave are detected from the sonometer here and uh, you can send it to the surface buoy and also the surface buoy measure sort of like the uh, change of the water level. And uh, so if we can place these sensors around the interesting region where there might be a uh, you know, high possibility or probability where this earthquake uh, can happen. So um, this uncertainty of the system is uh, you know, the slip along uh, the earthquake fault. So you don't really know where it's gonna happen, right? And uh, or when it's gonna happen. So this is the uncertainty. Uh, it depends both on space and also time. And uh, so you wanna like place the sensors essentially to collect the data. Um, this is the optimal experimental design problem. So for instance, here um, we have a, you know, the acoustic wave detect, well, uh, the model itself is a coupled elastic for the earthquake, acoustic for the acoustic wave and the gravity. Uh, a wave equation for the water uh, propagation, and also the shallow water equation from where the tsunami was uh, excited and propagated to their uh, coast. Uh, so um, here again, the uh, optimization problem is how to strategically place all the sensors uh, around the globe in order to best, uh, you know, uh, sort of like uh, extract the uh, data or, or do some early detection of uh, this tsunami, and also you can send their uh, early warning. Um, well, the third example is a bit different. So here we have a, a you know, there are sort of like a two uh, segments, a, a dye block, a polymer. You have like the red part and the blue part. So because of their, uh, you know, uh, attraction force, it can form in mean, different uh, patterns. Uh, so here you can see it, it can form either into their, you know, sort of like a circular pattern or their uh, parallel um, pattern. Um, and uh, well, we can use this property of the sort of like a self-assembly uh, property of the materials in order to uh, manufacture some materials. For instance, like uh, for the uh, semiconductor uh, industry, once you go to very small scale, maybe you cannot manufacture it directly, but you want to rely on the um, property of the materials to self-assemble into a certain um, pattern or morphology. But however, here you want to uh, use some sort of like the guidance of, uh, um, you know, uh, some other different materials that it can control in order to form a target morphology. The model here itself is a self-consistent field theory or a non-local kind of equation where you can model uh, uh, this uh, evolution or progression of uh, these materials. And uh, here the optimization, uh, for instance, here if you want to uh, manufacture this uh, parallel uh, materials and uh, you can actually place some uh, substrate, for instance, here and this this one and this one and this one, uh, not in a very small scale. Let's say here, if on a class like uh, one nanometer, uh, the distance, and here maybe you can allow it to have uh, uh, four nanometers. Um, so maybe right now with the technique is you can manufacture four nanometer structure, and then uh, this material will self-assemble into uh, this structure if you place the substrate here. And now the problem is how to, you know, uh, optimally place the substrate. And this perhaps is a um, quite a, a simple uh, target morphology, but this one is a bit more uh, interesting. So you have this target morphology, you wanted the materials like uh, essentially uh, involved into this target morphology. And in order to do that, you can place some guidepost. It's like the substrate, but here is a different guidepost. It's a point-wise guidepost. So essentially uh, this guidepost uh, post attract a certain segment of the material. And uh, eventually it will uh, form into uh, this equilibrium set. If you place the guidepost uh, in a proper position, and uh, but however, the problem is uh, once you place the guidepost, if you start from different, let's say, initial condition of the materials, because at the beginning it's quite a mixed, and uh, this is a definite random initial phase of the uh, material, and also if there's some like uncertainty in the material property or the environment and te temperature for uh, the involution, for instance, you could end up with different morphology, like this one or this one. Those other let's say, material defects, right? You want to avoid those material defects as much as possible. Uh, in solving your uh, optimization problem. And then it becomes uh, optimization under under uh, this different uncertainty problem, this stochastic optimization problem. All right, so um, for this different uh, examples, uh, we have some like a common problems to solve. For instance, uh, here we have uh, the forward uncertainty propagation. We have the uncertain parameter theta. Theta could be like a random field or stochastic process here. We represent it like as simply as a you know, one dimensional random variable with certain distributions. And you want to propagate this uncertainty uh, into this complex system represented by R, which is a mathematical model, which depends on their, uh, you know, system state variable solution. Uh, and the theta is a parameter, uncertain parameter 
And Z is uh, some interesting other verb, like uh, the control variable, for instance, or the experimental design variable. And you have some quantitative interest depending on the solution of this complex system. And uh, maybe you want to evaluate this quantitative interest, or you want to, uh, this becomes like the objective function in your uh, optimal control problem, or the, uh, you know, the observables in your, um, in your uh, inverse problems. And then the second set of problems is a basic inference problem. So given that some noisy data, which is the observation on your state variable U here, and uh, uh, you know you have some uh, additive uh, uh, noise epsilon, and then you have uh, the basic inference, um, which give you the posterior distribution um, pi of theta condition on Y, and Z, Z could be here a design variable. Now, given this data, you can update your um, parameter distribution from the prime in black to the red in posterior, uh, right? And uh, then the next question is, uh, well, how do you best design? And this is Z. Z is a sort of like an optimal experimental design variable. Let's say, how do you place the sensors in the tsunami in case in order to get the best information to inform your system? Now, let's say we can uh, maximize a certain like information, let's say here. Uh, we call this information gains U, which depends on your data Y and also the sensor. And uh, we can take an average of this one is expected information gain. And uh, we can uh, solve this maximization problem in order to uh, optimize uh, your sensor as a placement. And then additionally, once you have a well calibrated system and you propagate the uncertainties to some uh, quantitative interest, and uh, this could become uh, your objective function to uh, minimize, or optimize, like in the material, self assembly material sense uh, case, right? And then you can solve some stochastic optimization problem where you have a Q as the objective function uh, because it's uh, uncertain, depending on the uncertain variable theta. And you want to measure their statistics like the expectation of rho theta or some like a variance, some value at risk, for instance. And uh, it is a, essentially a statistical risk measure. And now you can optimize respect to your control or design variable Z. And it's, it becomes different from the optimal experiment design here. This Z is independent. It could be like a control or design of your system. You have a certain penalization of uh, this uh, control or design variable. So these are the problems uh, we are interested in. Some uh, common challenges, including the first uh, uh, complex models is typically described by partial differential equations that we show in their different uh, examples. Those are expensive to solve, right? And then second is the uncertain parameters that have a complex distribution. For instance, here, even in 2D, it could be like a non-Gaussian, multimodal, non-local, uh, well, local uh, concentrated distribution. It could also be high dimensional, like for instance, uh, if you discretize a random field, it becomes like a high dimensional. Each of the point is a random variable and uh, there is certain correlation. And uh, well, our optimization problem could be also high dimensional, right? The uh, optimization variable becomes very high dimensional. And uh, this optimization variable in different cases, like for instance, in optimal experimental design is an experiment. And uh, in our optimal design control problem, it is a control design uh, variables. And this optimization problem could be high dimensional and also non-convex. So these are the common challenges. And some of the opportunities to uh, address these challenges is, uh, first of all, to solve these complex models, we can use some uh, you know, surrogate models. If these surrogate models have a certain required accuracy and also faster to evaluate, uh, you can sort of like uh, construct this surrogate model and deploy uh, in your uh, um, you know, uh, different kinds of problems. And then uh, for the high dimensional um, you know, uh, challenge, essentially a lot of uh, you know, classical algorithms that suffer from this curse of dimensionality. And here you, you can exploit the, from the parameter to the solution map or from the parameter to the observable, like quantitative interest map or some objective map. Those maps are typically uh, intrinsically low dimensional depending on different applications. So you can exploit this intrinsic low dimensionality property. And uh, the next one is uh, you know, for the optimization problem, Maybe some of the black box optimization uh, system, you don't have any control. But however, for some of the uh, problems, like the complex models governed by uh, partial differential equations, you can cook up, um, you know, if you can uh, compute with some uh, gradient or derivative information, you can use derivative best uh, adaptive optimization method. And this method tends to be a uh, dimension independent uh, in terms of like the dimension for the optimization variable. All right, let's see for the first, uh, uh, which is forward uncertainty propagation. Uh, there are different kinds of uh, like uh, surrogate models uh, being built, uh, but over the last uh, a few years, there is uh, one very interesting uh, surrogate model. It's called neural operators. So neural operator is one approximated the solution operator uh, theta to uh, u here, or some quantitative interest theta to q. 
uh, by neural networks, right? This Q of theta uh, uh, can be approximated by this F of theta. Theta is our input. W here is, uh, let's say, the neural network weights, and F itself is the neural network. There are different types of neural operators, like a Fourier neural operator, where you apply the, uh, this a Fourier transform and also convolution. And there is a deep operator network where you have a, you know, a special uh, structure where you have a branch net to take into account these parameters. And also there's a, a trunk net to take into, that, uh, into account of the physical variables like the space or time. And uh, there's also, you know, for this high dimensionality of this theta and also possibly Q and U, you can do some dimension reduction uh, using reduced basis, for instance, architecture. You can do the uh, dimension reduction by projecting the input and output to low dimensional subspace. And there being uh, different techniques uh, developed. Uh, for instance, uh, for this one, the uh, PCA net, which is essentially you perform the PCA principal component analysis for the input and output, and you build the neural network in between. And uh, we've also developed uh, the so called deep net, it's a derivative informed uh, projected neural network. I'm going to talk a little bit later on. So there, is a, 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 there are two papers uh, uh, for the comparison of different neural operators. Uh, there's a uh, you know this one for comprehensive fair comparison. Essentially, this two neural operators is a Fourier neural operator and deep uh, operator network by also incorporating some additional reduced basis architecture. And also there's also this one uh, cost accuracy trade-off and credit learning. So essentially, from these papers, uh, one of the conclusion uh, you can draw is uh, um, this PCA net or the POD deep O net, uh, which explore their you know low dimensionality of the problems that tends to perform better for high dimensional and large scale problems, uh, where these problems have intrinsic low dimensionality. And uh, so that's uh, what we're gonna use uh, here in a development of our deep net. So uh, what do we do here, instead of uh, project their you know, input into their uh, principal component analysis as uh, the previous paper here, uh, this one, uh, PCA net, uh, we wanna exploit some like a sensitivity information uh, so essentially, uh, we project our uh, input into this sort of like active subspace. Active subspace is formed as you compute the eigenvalue uh, decomposition of uh, this quantity. This is uh, the Jacobian of uh, this Q respect to theta. This Q could be your solution self, right? And uh, this Jacobian transpose times Jacobian. You take the expectation um, with respect to the distribution of the theta, and you perform their uh, eigen decomposition of it. And then this eigenbasis, uh, like leading eigenbasis, will be the subspace for you to project their uh, high dimensional, like a uh, dimension D theta to R theta R could be, uh, let's say a few tens from your original system could be millions. And uh, um, so if this eigenvalue decay pretty fast, that means like uh, you can preserve the information of your input uh, pretty well with a low dimensional uh, subspace. And it can, you can do, uh, you know, this POD on subspace for the output, which is a, a relatively simple, you just form their, you know, covariance of your output and, and perform eigenvalue decomposition. Also truncated somewhere, you perform the projection to the low dimensions. Now you only need to train a low dimensional neural network in here. And uh, so essentially we have an error bound. So uh, suppose we, we perform this input output uh, projection with the trailing, uh, with the eigenvalues and uh, the error. Uh, so this is the original output. Minus, you know, you have the input projection and output projection. So measuring in our two sense, it can be upper bounded by the trailing of the eigenvalues. So essentially where you truncate our theta and our Q, you truncate at these numbers, then if the eigenvalue decay pretty fast, this truncation error will also be small. So we call this derivative form of the projecting neural network, which is deep net. And uh, well, here is a one example. Uh, it is a, a Hamel's equation, which is web um, web equation, which is uh, quite challenging. In fact, like a lot of uh, new operators, I cannot do a very good job for their uh, Hamel's equation. Uh, so we assume we have a, a here in the a web number we have a parameter theta follows Gaussian distribution with covariance as Martin Martin uh, type of covariance. It's given by their minus der, uh, delta plus uh, gamma. This is a Laplace to the power minus two. And then uh, we do the discretization for this is theta. Uh, well, here, for instance, like uh, if we, uh, uh, well, this is a, a defining a domain of a uh, uh, square domain. If you do the uh, discretization one direction, 128, you get this number of parameters. There's a 16,000 parameters, right? If you do the projection into the low dimensional uh, uh, neural network, you get the, the size of the neural network. Essentially, the number of parameters you train is about 2,000. And the full space, if you do not do any projection, 
uh, then it's about a three uh, point four million. Uh, of course, it depends on the different architecture of the neural network. But essentially, you can see by the projection, it can dramatically reduce the size of the neural network. And here we have a, a different basis. So on the left, we have active subspace base a basis uh, computed from uh, you know previously what we had here. Uh, and you can also do their sort of like a Kahunian logic expansion for the PCA uh, for the input projection. And uh, this PCA does not take into account their solution itself, but this active subspace can actually detect the you know sensitivity or their uh, solution uh, pattern uh, for the web propagation. So here is a neural network approximation accuracy with uh, uh, the different number of training data. So you can see here with a small number of training data uh, with this our like active subspace projection and uh, the projection basis is only eight, we can get a pretty good accuracy already. And if you increase the number of uh, training data, you can increase the accuracy. And uh, this is a compared with the other projection like uh, the KOE or the PCA projection and random subspace projection. And uh, also we have the full space uh, neural network, like full space. So essentially this um, projected neural network can outperform the other type of neural networks. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so there are some other examples in the, in the um, paper, but here we have a sort of like the scalability test. Essentially, if we are uh, uh, here, instead of like a 128, we have a 64 degree freedom and then total number of degree for the parameter is about 4,000 and a full space is about 1 million. And here, deep net, if you use the same projections, the same dimension, right? This does not change. So uh, if you increase the, uh, the resolution, it's still the same uh, deep net. And uh, it is pretty much you have a similar uh, accuracy uh, with respect to the number of training data. Uh, all right, so let's go to the next uh, problem, which is BS inference. And uh, well, for BS inference, um, in general, here's a, a framework. We have a data Y and we have a parameter theta. We have a map from the parameter theta to the observable, uh, which is F. And we have additive uh, noise, uh, epsilon. Uh, follows a certain Gaussian distribution with Gaussian uh, noise uh, covariance I said here. And a parameter theta could be in high dimensions, D could be infinite, for instance, for random field. And uh, the Bayesian rule uh, tells us the posterior is given by, you know, the likelihood times the prior under the assumption of the data and the prior, uh, they're independent divided by this model evidence or normalization constant, which is an uh, integral of the likelihood respect to the prior. There have been many different kinds of uh, you know, methods developed, like uh, the Laplace approximation, uh, MCMC, some accelerated MCMC, sparse quadrature, marginal uh, inference, and so on. Over the years, there have been developed a few different methods, including you know, the sparse grid uh, reduced basis for the uh, acceleration of the forward problem, and uh, some adaptive uh, sparse quadrature, and uh, more recently have developed this projected uh, stand version of Newton, and also creating decent method based on this uh, you know, uh, optimum transport type of a uh, method. And uh, we also push it to the Weinstein gradient descent method uh, for high dimensional BS inference. And also uh, to approximate this Weinstein direction, we also applied the so-called like optimal neural network approximation. We converted this neural network training to some convex optimization. If you're interested, perhaps I can take a look at these papers, but uh, 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 let me actually show you uh, one, uh, you know, simple uh, sort of like a, uh, just to find the map point, the maximum a posterior point instead of the uh, characterized full posterior distribution. So suppose we have a Gaussian prior theta, uh, we have uh, the mean and the covariance. Now the map point is given by, you know, you solve this minimization problem. Uh, here we, uh, we have the data Y, have a parameter to observable map. And uh, here's essentially the data misfit term. And here's a, a prior regularization term. You have the prior covariance here. And you wanna solve this minimization problem to get the map point. And for instance, here, if this is our data and uh, this is our map point, and this will be the simulated, uh, you know, the model output based on this uh, map point. You can see pretty good uh, match between the data and uh, the model output. So here to solve this problem, um, for instance, we need to, because the theta is very high dimensional, we want to use some gradient or Newton based method instead of some gradient free method. And uh, to use this method, we need to compute the Jacobians, which essentially, you know, you evaluated their, uh, the sort of like a, a derivative of this app with respect to the theta. And uh, so now uh, our, you know, our challenge is uh, we want to approximate this app accurately, but at the same time, we want to also approximate this derivative, this Jacobian also accurately. So our neural operator should do a good job for the uh, approximation of this theta to app and also theta to J to the Jacobian. 
And uh, so we developed this uh, neural network, uh, neural operator, so called like derivative form of the uh, neural operator. We do pretty much the same thing as an input projection and output projection. Uh, you know, so here on uh, this app, theta can be approximated by this neural network, but the only difference here would be uh, coming from here. So, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, our uh, map point optimizer uh, problem. Uh, what we do is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it's, it's not a map point. It's essentially the uh, loss function of our uh, neural network training, where we have, uh, uh, you know, the projected uh, uh, data and also the neural network. So essentially, we want to match our neural network with respect to uh, our data, but it's projecting the low dimensional space. Now, this neural network is very small and dimensional, right? We only work in the low, reduce the dimension here. And also, in the second term is uh, we want to match our Jacobian also projected in their input and output spaces. Now, this becomes a small uh, matrix. And uh, we can take the derivative of our uh, neural network output with respect to the input. And uh, we want to match this Jacobian's. So essentially, um, by this matching, uh, we hope that our uh, you know approximation of the Jacobian will become more accurate than if we do not include this term. But in fact, it turns out that by including this term, it also improved the accuracy of the approximation for the output. So, for instance, here we have a, a simple test problem, the inverse problem of a density flow. We have a, you know the, the uh, diffusion equation that theta is a log normal distribution. You have a Gaussian distribution with covariance Martin type, similar as before. And we have uh, you know, this equation with the proper boundary conditions like the Dirichlet one here, zero here, and Neumann boundary condition on the left and right. And we have some like observation points here about uh, 50. So uh, uh, by solving the map point, essentially this is our, let's say synthetic prior sample with a certain number of uh, uh, observation points, we can obtain this map point by solving an element uh, problem. And also we can solve the neural network problem by plugging our surrogate in here. Right, and uh, uh, this will be our uh, reduced uh, neural network uh, map point. We can see pretty close uh, map point by neural network and also find an element. And uh, more importantly here, uh, if we you know increase the number of training data, let's see here. Uh, on the left, we use the, the dyno training essentially by including the Jacobi information. On the right, we do not include Jacobi information. This is for different quantities. Like uh, here on the blue is for the uh, F, the map result. And uh, on the red is a reduced Jacobian here. And here is a map point in green. So we, we match their uh, you know, neural network output uh, and also uh, the map point computed by neural network. Uh, we sort of like measure the relative error. You can see here uh, with the Jacobian training, all of them, they'll be more accurate than without a Jacobian uh, in the loss function. And more importantly here, for their map point, uh, it, it becomes much more accurate than if we do not include this Jacobian information. So uh, that's actually how the Jacobian uh, uh, becomes helpful for our problem. Uh, so in fact, you can also apply it to the optimal experimental design problem. And uh, uh, let's see, so here, um, here's the, uh, the, the setup of the problem. Uh, so essentially it's optimal sensor placement. Uh, the question is where to place our sensors. Let's say here, we have nine candidate locations. We want to place the sensors, like the three sensors, for instance. If we place the third sensor here, uh, the first sensor at the third location will be like the first row will have a third column as one. And uh, you can go on here for the other two uh, sensors. And now we have the design matrix W. So apparently it's binary and uh, it, it satisfies certain conditions. So the sum of uh, this uh, row is one. The sum of column is between zero and one. And uh, so this is essentially the constraint for the uh, sensor. And how do you, you know, uh, pick up the sensor like a certain number R? Let's say you have a budget of a, uh, placing R sensors out of uh, D candidates. How do you place this R sensors out of D uh, candidates? And this is uh, sort of like a com uh, combinatorial optimization problem. And uh, uh, like, uh, you know, this is a, a, a quite a simple uh, problem. This is something like, uh, as we talked about for us, the, in the tsunami application, and uh, while here, also over the years, we developed some uh, methods. Well, in fact, uh, Shun uh, 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 early on developed this, uh, you know, uh, simulation-based optimal experimental design for nonlinear systems becomes a quite uh, popular influ influence, uh, influential at the, at the moment. And then there's also some recent work. Uh, there's been a lot of other uh, works, but this recent work is also very interesting. The sequential optimal experimental design. 
of a nonlinear uh, dynamics using this uh, gradient reinforcement learning. And uh, also over the last few years, we developed some uh, fast and scalable optimization method in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the measure, the, the sort of like, a, we want to accelerate their um, process of the optimization and also uh, should be scalable with back to their uh, degree of freedom in your uh, approximation uh, using a Laplace and a low rank approximation here and also reduced basis approximation. And also uh, recently uh, using deep neural networks, including their, um, uh, including their uh, deep net and also dyno. Uh, let me uh, show perhaps a little bit about their different setup here. So essentially for the optimum experimental design problem for the sensor placement, we want to maximize the information or optimality criteria here of psi, depending on your design matrix W. And this psi uh, uh, could be different like uh, criteria. For instance, it could be there uh, from information theory, you have expected information gain, which is a uh, you know the Kubek labular divergence between the posterior distribution and your prior distribution, and uh, you want to measure the average of respect to the data here. This is expected information gain. You want to sort of like maximize this one uh, to gain the most information, right? And uh, there's also covariance based, uh, which is the A or D optimality or some other optimality. Essentially, here the A optimality, uh, you measure the trust of the posterior covariance, and uh, so essentially, it gives you a sense of uncertainty in your posterior. You want to minimize this average uh, trace. Essentially, you want to minimize the uncertainty in your posterior. And this is a D determinant, is a determinant of uh, uh, the covariance. Okay, so uh, we applied uh, this deep net uh, derivative informed uh, project neural network for their uh, expected information gain. So here uh, we use uh, you know to compute this double. To compute this uh, quantity, there is expectation with respect to data. There is expectation with respect to their, uh, you know, posterior distribution. You can sort of like rearrange the terms, and uh, you require a double uh, integral. And uh, so we use this so-called so double loop Monte Carlo. We draw samples from this um, distribution, and we can evaluate this uh, expected information again. So if you apply this deep net approximation, we can. Uh, get an upper bound for the EIG approximation error by the deep net error in R2 norm and time a constant. And uh, so here you can see for the relative error of the EIG, if you simply apply the double loop of Monte Carlo with the same computational cost, and uh, you will have a you know, larger and larger uh, relative error for the approximation of the EIG at different number of sensors. And if you apply uh, this surrogate, a deep net to compute their, you know, uh, from the parameter to their observable map, and uh, you apply this double loop Monte Carlo, you can actually preserve the accuracy uh, pretty well uh, across a different number of uh, sensors. And uh, well, this is about the EIG. We also developed for this A and D optimality criteria. For instance, like here for the A optimality, a bit more in detail. Here, this posterior covariance actually is computed at the map point. So you first go to the map point and you build a local Laplace approximation. And then this is uh, uh, the covariance of the local Laplace approximation. So, so you take the trace and you take the expectation, right? And then uh, you can sort of like minimize uh, this quantity. Uh, this is a, a optimality. Uh, again, here, this is a D optimality. The only difference is a determinant. And the posterior covariance at the map point, it is actually given by, it's a little bit complicated. It depends on data Y and design W. And here is given by the misfit term. We check the Haitian of the misfit term. Uh, and uh, you have the prior term. And uh, this is uh, the inverse of it uh, is a uh, uh, posterior covariance based on the Laplace approximation. And here we use a Gauss Newton uh, Haitian approximation. Essentially, this Haitian term, the second order derivative of uh, your, you know, the data misfit term with respect to the parameter. And uh, now you can approximate it by Gauss Newton Haitian approximation by checking the Jacobian here. Now Jacobian pop it up again. So you have a Jacobian of uh, the parameter uh, of uh, the quantitative interest, well, of the observ observables with respect to the theta, right? So this is a Gauss-Newton uh, approximation. Now, in order to evaluate this quantity, A optimality or D optimality, essentially, you want to first compute a map point, which we did um, a few slides ago. And also, you want to approximate this Jacobian here for given data. And uh, so here, we apply this uh, GPO, uh, dyno so essentially, we get a good approximation of this Jacobian. And then here, uh, another uh, attention we need to uh, pay is uh, essentially for the approximation of a different quantity, like map point, uh, we need to use the 
you know, PCA basis or the KOE basis. Uh, otherwise, if you use the active subspace basis, the approximation of the map point by neural network is not that great. And uh, if you use uh, the PCA basis with increasing number of bases, you can get smaller and smaller relative error for the approximation of the map point. And uh, on the other hand, for the Jacobian approximation, we need to project down into this active subspace basis. Uh, but if you do that for the PCA basis, the reduction is not that uh, evident. So this paper is uh, about um, uh, coming out uh, quite soon. And here we have uh, uh, the results. Essentially, um, you know, we can use the neural network to approximate the trace and also find the element to approximate the trace. So uh, we have about a certain number of, uh, you know, sensors. Uh, we can approximate them pretty well. So essentially the neural network and the find element that can match each other quite well. And uh, the regression line you can see here, we have uh, our uh, square score quite close to one. This is uh, for the trace and uh, the average error is about 0.76% and there's a certain uh, standard deviation of this approximation. And also this is a determinant. This is also pretty close. So essentially we can use this neural network approximation for the A and D optimality for the optimization of uh, the problem. All right, so now let's come to the, uh, the last problem, which is a stochastic optimization. And again, here um, for this example, for instance, we want to uh, have a term, which is uh, you know, the risk measure of the quantity that interest the Q. And uh, so here we take the conditional value at risk. So this is a quite a conservative uh, uh, risk measure. So essentially here, let's say, if this is our, our quantity of interest Q going from zero to 70, right? And we have the probability density here. Uh, you have the blue line of probability density. And then uh, um, here, for instance, like uh, you wanna take the expectation, the expectation will be somewhere here and uh, somewhere here, right? And if you want to take some value at risk, which is a, somehow like a, the, so, the so-called quantile value at risk, I can take a certain level of a value at risk, like a beta level. So essentially the probability of the tau here is about one minus beta. And uh, so if you take the conditional value at risk, essentially you want to integrate your quantity of interest, the Q, with respect to their uh, distribution of the Q over uh, this risk level. So essentially you don't want to, like uh, compare only about the risk level, but also uh, if there is a, a risk, what is uh, the loss expected the shortfall in financial uh, engineering uh, sense. So essentially what is expected the loss. And uh, depending on the uh, parameter beta, you would have a different like uh, risk, uh, risk uh, uh, measure. Like if you use the beta equals to zero, it becomes a mean. If you use the beta equals to one, then it becomes like uh, the maximum here, the maximum. It becomes a worst case scenario optimization. And for the Z-bar, uh, we have different, uh, we have this, we use this, this form of, uh, you know, uh, equivalent form of uh, the definition for this Z-bar. So essentially it can be converted to a one dimensional optimization problem. And also for this uh, max function, we can use a smooth approximation to apply derivative, in, derivative or gradient based optimization method. And, uh, uh, okay, all right. So also over the years, uh, we've been developing some of the methods uh, based on different uh, techniques, uh, like uh, we use the reduced basis method, like uh, also sparse uh, quadrature multi-level type of approximation and uh, some uh, recent work on Taylor approximation, essentially Taylor approximation of your objective function with your with respect to your prior uh, uncertainty. And uh, also applied it for chance constraint optimization with some applications to acoustic metamaterials and turbulence, uh, turbulence control. And uh, very recently, um, we developed this uh, based on the uh, neural uh, operators. So we use the neural operators to uh, approximate this sort of like from their input to output map and we deploy it for the stochastic optimization problem. We had some analysis on the performance uh, bound, essentially with these different approximations, uh, how do you bond uh, the approximation of your objective function and also how do you bond their uh, control function? Uh, well. Okay, so this is uh, um, you know, uh, sort of like extended version of a derivative informed the neural operator. We have there now, instead of uh, just the parameter theta, we can, you know, again, project down to low dimensions, right? We also have another input, which is uh, the control variable or design variable. So we have this multi-input. And uh, for the output, we can still use the same uh, POD basis, for instance. Now this becomes our multi-input reduced basis um, uh, dyno. We call it the Mr. Dyno here. And uh, so essentially here, um, this is our neural network approximation for the solution. Uh, and this formula essentially embedded this uh, architecture. And now uh, in our training, again, we have this 
Jacobian, uh, but the Jacobian now is not about their in you know, some quantum interest with respect to their parameter theta, but rather we have their uh, derivative of the Jacobian of uh, the neural network, uh, which is approximation of the solutions of respect to the control variable. So uh, this is a neural network, uh, and this is a, a so-called like a, the, the Jacobian that it can compute it from your uh, PDEs. We have the match of the solution and also match of the Jacobian. We measured it by R2 norm here and also the Hebert Smith norm uh, for the Jacobian data. All right, so uh, this is a little bit more details. So essentially, we train the neural network again, you reduce the space. Like, you uh, know, um, originally we have a, this is stuff to train. This U is in high dimensions and uh, this Jacobian is also in high dimensions. Now we project it down to low dimensions from D theta DU to R theta RU from like millions of dimensions to a few tens, let's say. Now then our neural network becomes a small dimensional. Uh, so this is the first term, um, you know, it can work a little bit and you see this is the first term. And more interestingly is the second term. So we can project down our uh, Jacobi information to a low dimensional subspace. And uh, uh, this is a neural network uh, Jacobian computation. You might wonder, well, you need to compute the Jacobian, right? Which is a derivative of your PD solution with respect to some control variable. Now, how do you get that information? Well, actually, um, we can get that information by solving some adjoint uh, or linearized PDs by sensitivity analysis. For instance, like the, if your original PD is represented by R, uh, depending on U, theta, and Z, right? And in fact, we can take the derivative of this equation with respect to your uh, control variable Z. And then uh, there will be a term uh, by chain rule that popped out for this Jacobian. And uh, if you act this Jacobian on this basis, so essentially, uh, you know, you have this term. Uh, it looks like a bit complex, but essentially by chain rule, you know, you take the derivative of this R respect to Z, there'll be a term of uh, this one, right? The partial derivative with respect to Z. And another term which uh, relates to, uh, you know, the partial derivative of, of R with respect to U and also U with respect to Z. So you pull out this term on the right-hand side now uh, to compute this term, which is uh, this term here. You only need to solve this equation. Now this becomes a linearized equation. It doesn't really matter if your original state equation is linear or nonlinear. This equation is linear. And uh, uh, you can solve this uh, linearized uh, PDEs from the either right-hand side or the, uh, from the left-hand side, uh, depending on the dimension of uh, uh, your either you know, the Z variable or the, the dimension of the Z, for instance, if it is not a very high dimensional, uh, you can perform this solve before you apply this one. Or if the RU is a small, as this is a sort of like the basis, right? You can perform this solve, the joint solve, before you compute this quantity. So essentially, uh, uh, we can solve this linearized PDs in order to get in for this information. You might wonder uh, what it's a cost, right? If it is a very expensive to solve it, uh, then this additional training data could be uh, not so beneficial. So here we have a test. Uh, well, for two problems, one is the semilinear uh, elliptic problem, another is 2D navier stokes equation. So to solve the state of uh, PD problem, um, this is about the time, um, or depending on the resolution, right? Depending on discretization, we use one element and they discretize it, and uh, we use a direct solver. So this is about a time to solve the semilinear elliptic equation. This is about 12 seconds, 13 seconds to solve the 2D navier stokes equation. And then for uh, solving this problem. So essentially this is a, you know, the linearized. Once you fix the U, uh, you can actually solve this problem uh, many, many times with the same linearized operator. So you can actually do the LU factorization for it first before you apply it to solve many times this one. So if you apply the LU factorization, this is the time for the elliptic problem is about, you know, one third of this time, uh, between one uh, half and one third. So this is a time is about one third, uh, one fourth of uh, the time to solve a set of PD. And after you do the LU factorization for the linear operator, uh, you can do the subsequent LU solve. Essentially, uh, you just apply the LU in your uh, solve of the problem. Now, this becomes much faster. So essentially, this is the time it takes to uh, compute this quantity. So essentially, to compute the Jacobian information, it's just some additional uh, solve compared to your steady equation. About less, uh, like for some of the problems, about 20% 20, 20 of additional solve additional uh, computational time to get this information. All right, so this is an example of uh, the flu control around a bluff body. So essentially we have uh, you know, the steady state and every stock equation. 
we have some like uncertainty coming from here. For instance, there is some like inflow uh, velocity uncertainty, and uh, we can control this uh, boundary uh, for this bluff body, and we can control this boundary here and here. And uh, we want to minimize sort of like the drag uh, afterwards uh, here uh, behind this bluff body. So we assume there is uh, some uncertainty uh, for the input velocity. Uh, we assume like uh, also the uh, Gaussian running field, the type of uh, uh, running field, uh, the boundary condition, and also the control profile around this uh, block body. We assume we have a parametric control, which is uh, uh, given by the B splines. And uh, now we have some uh, coefficient Z i to control. We have uh, the basis function uh, C to i, which are the B splines. And then our uh, control objective function one is uh, this uh, viscosity and dissipation term objective functions uh, symmetric of this Jacobian BU and uh, it detect the uh, sort of like inner product, detect the integral here. And another is a tracking type. For instance, we have a U target without any circulation. And then we can uh, uh, sort of like uh, uh, minimize this uh, tracking type of objective function. And we have additional penalization term, this PZ is given by the R times essentially uh, you know, this cost uh, for control. There are two norms for the cost of a control. All right, so uh, here's uh, for the 2D example, um, which is quite simple. We, we use uh, you know, non-uniform mesh uh, with Taylor hold uh, elements for the final element approximation. We use a galerkin least square stabilization for this problem. And also we use weakly imposed boundary condition uh, to put it in the weak form. And uh, also uh, when they're, uh, you know, uh, when the Reynolds number is pretty high, we use a viscosity continuation to solve this problem. Essentially, we start uh, we start from the small Reynolds number and we continue to a high Reynolds number. So the state um, the state uh, dimension is about forty two thousand, and we can compress it down to about two hundred. But the parameter is about one hundred along the boundary, right? And so we also we don't do much uh, reduction. Uh, and uh, for the control, it's a parametric spline, so eighteen dimensional. So for the neural network, we uh, we have the input of uh, you know this 100 plus 18 is 118. Output is 200, and we use like a, you know two hidden layers. That's very simple uh, architecture. So uh, now we can train this neural network, and then we can solve this problem. This is original without any control. Uh, you can see here there is a circulation, and uh, so if we use a control around this uh, boundary, then we can sort of like uh, reduce this this circulation, right? This is a uh, what do we uh, want to achieve? And uh, we solve this problem by risk measure of uh, uh, this is a C bar uh, because we're, the uncertainty coming from the in, in inflow. So uh, yeah, let, let's see a bit about the computational comparison in terms of a cost and accuracy. So here uh, it's a little bit complicated. Let me uh, illustrate it a little bit more. We have perhaps another uh, couple of minutes. So uh, on the x-axis is the number of steady equations you just saw uh, in order to solve this uh, optimization on uncertainty problem, the whole problem, how many like a, um, a steady PD solving you need to have. And on the y-axis is a relative optimal cost error. So essentially, eventually uh, we arrived at their you know, optimum control, we measure the error uh, compared to some reference. So for instance, we can use the PD with many, many samples in order to compute their uh, optimization um, problem. And now, uh, so here, in order to compute this C bar, we use different number of samples, Monte Carlo samples. And uh, these are the number of samples, like for instance, this corresponds to the uh, uh, PD solve without any neural operator, is a PD solve. So we use different number of uh, samples for the sample average approximation to compute this C bar. And with the increasing number of samples at each uh, optimization iteration, right? And uh, we can reduce the error uh, if you increase the number of samples. And the, the total number of PDs we solve is also increased. And here, if you use the, the dyno the, or the missed dyno, you can use this number to train the neural network first. And after you train it with this number, you can just simply deploy it uh, to solve the problem without any PD solve anymore. So this would be uh, the accuracy, the corresponding accuracy here. But this neural network is actually, we don't use the Jacobian in our uh, loss function. Uh, and uh, so you can see, uh, we need to use many more like training data and still the accuracy is not as good as, uh, you know, this uh, dyno uh, neural operator. And this is about one of their, uh, you know, object functions, the dissipation. This is another tracking type. Uh, this is more evident, right? You can see here uh, you have the PDD uh, error. You have uh, the dyno error. 
and uh, it's about let's say to achieve the same accuracy like uh, here uh maybe the number of a total pd is, uh, is just a couple of 100 uh 256 but uh, uh here to solve the pd uh, best uh, OUU problem you need to like uh, tens of thousands of uh, pd solves so essentially in this sense uh we can achieve about uh in about a hundred uh, times more sample efficient. So essentially we use a certain number of samples to train our neural network first, and then we deploy it in our application. Uh, so the number of uh, uh, samples we need to uh, use is uh, much smaller, like uh, at least 100 times smaller for this particular problem in 2D. Let's see for the uh, 3D problem. It's also, you know, we have the blood body in 3D, you have the income random inflow velocity, and then you have the state variable is about 1 million degrees freedom. Reduce the dimension, we use the same architecture. And a parameter on the boundary is about 4,000 now. We can do some reduction and control is 50 dimensional. And uh, so we computed only about 500 samples. So we achieved about 1.5% uh, of our two generalization accuracy for our neural uh, operator approximation. So once you constructed it, uh, it's about 10 million times faster than PD solves. And also, you know, each of the PD solves because it's three dimensions. Uh, it's a navy stocks nonlinear, so we use about a 30 minutes uh, in about a 48 course CPU course to solve one uh, PD. After you get this training data, uh, you can accelerate it about like 10 million times faster, right? And also to solve the problem to reduce the drag, uh, the Mr. Dino only use about uh, uh, less than one minute to solve the whole uh, optimization on uncertainty problem. Uh, yeah, th that's pretty much what I want to uh, say about our. Um, a neural network is Dino, and so essentially you can see uh, it's uh, accurate for both the input output map and also for the Jacobian, right? If you include the Jacobian in the training, and the reduced basis architecture helps to uh, scale the problem to high dimensions. And uh, we uh, require a small amount of training data because of this additional uh, information. And uh, we showed it for different optimization problems like inference experiment or control problem on uncertainty. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, some minutes for questions. Uh, it looks like adding availability to the computer is also uh, adding more to adding to and that's a very good question. In fact, uh, this Jacobian is the first order derivative. Uh, you, if you can afford it to, uh, like, get a high order derivative, like the Haitian information, for instance, uh, you can sure uh, like embed this uh, second order information in. But however, there might be an additional challenge for the neural network because you need to take their second order derivative with respect to input, and also in the optimization of the neural network, you have to take another uh, derivative with respect to your neural network width. Right? There's as about a third order derivative. And uh, well, with the current software, if you take high order derivatives, it's typically is not that very efficient. And uh, that, that's uh, some, uh, let's say like a computational uh, challenges, but for sure you can embed the high order derivative information. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Just some flow charts at some uh, slides. Yeah. So uh, the part, uh, in this technique that is taking the place of a PD solver. Yeah. Is really the middle part? Yeah. It's the whole thing. Yeah. It, which one? The middle or the whole? Well, this is actually the middle, for instance. Yeah. Uh, you know, we need to solve this problem, right? So we need to solve this uh, minimization problem. We need to compute this C bar. And uh, this C bar can be computed by Monte Carlo sampling, for instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to minimize the whole stuff. Um, but uh, along the way, we have to solve PDs. Now we replace our PDs by our neural operator. The surrogate model. Yeah, surrogate model. Yes. And we run pretty much the same algorithm, except that we replace the PD by our neural operator. And uh, yeah, so the, the, now the, pro, the the question you ask is, uh, you know, uh, if you train the neural operator and then deploy it for solving the problem, uh, so how many sa training samples you, you need, right? right. If, if the number of training sample is more than what you need just by using finite element, then yeah. what's the point to, yeah. to construct yeah. neural operator, right? So in our test, we show that uh, we can use a much smaller number of training samples to get the same accuracy. Okay. Uh, like, the, you know. This has something to do with the derivative information. Yeah, it has something to do with the derivative. If we do not use the derivative, as I hear, uh, it's not as accurate as uh, in the PD solver, right? 
And uh, maybe this one is a bit better, but this one, you see, like the derivative information does help quite a bit. How do you feel about this idea that you can maybe have a similar idea including this derivative information into a PDE solver. I mean, a more classical method. Because yeah. I think that should be possible. Yeah, that, that's actually a good idea. For instance, in the iterative solver, yeah. right? Maybe, uh, uh, I think there are uh, some ongoing work actually right. on approximating their preconditioner, for instance, right. like uh, adaptive preconditioner using neural network. Yeah. And that helps for the iterative solver. Yeah, I think yeah. this work, I think, is very similar to like uh, Nathan Foots, Steve Burton. Yeah. They have all this reduction of order methods. Yeah. But I think they are still using a PD solver in the middle. Okay. I believe. Okay. So um, I'm not criticizing the sort of bit method, but I think yeah. like we can do the we can do something, keep your front and back, and then create a yeah. nice PD solver. Yeah. Because if you throw away PD solver, and yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. You may sometimes lose some information about the the model that yeah. you were holding on to. Yeah, um, yeah. Use neural network. You, Kind of throw that information away. So yeah, that's, that's right. The best of all worlds. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good idea. Uh, in fact, the motivation for us, for instance, like uh, if we solve this problem, um, uh, like uh, just one PD solve, right? It takes about a thirty minutes and forty eight uh, CPU cores. Mm -hmm. Even if you just uh, you know require a small number of solves, it's already a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but if you completely uh, replace the PD solver by your surrogate model. And uh, eventually, you just use less than one seconds to one minutes to solve the whole problem. But however, uh, you might wonder what's the accuracy, right? right. And uh, so here we we have some accuracy here, uh, and also some accuracy comparison in here. We we cannot guarantee, uh, you know, for the three D case, um, we don't have a reference solution. It's too expensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, we gotta yeah. vacate. Uh, there's a okay. class coming, so all right. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Let's uh, uh, again. Thank you. Thank you.